and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top-selling games from May 1988. I compare arcade clones. I play some games. Have a chat to Jeff. And fix an old add-on. But first, it's the news. Derek Brewster, the man quite well known to many Spectrum fans as having written early games like Velnor's Lair, Star Clash and Kentilla, has set up his own budget label called Zeppelin Games. Their first game releases are due very soon, with two new games, Sabotage and Frontline. The new label will also release older titles, such as Derek's games at budget prices. US Gold have picked up several honours at this year's Computer and Video Games Awards. They were voted Best Software House, and their game Outrun was voted Game of the Year, and Best Arcade Game of the Year. Best Original Game was won by Nebulous from Houston Consultants, and the Adventure Game of the Year was Guild of Thieves from Magnetic Scrolls. Ocean Software are using their old Daily Thompson license and are planning to release a game to coincide with the Seoul Olympic Games. With the working title of Daily Thompson 88, the game will come with a lot of extras in the box, and even though the Spectrum version is currently only 33% complete, Ocean are making big claims about it. You will get to play daily in all 10 events of the Decathlon, but also take part in training sessions that will affect your performance once you are out on the track. The game is set to be released in August. Talking of reusing old licenses, and Ocean plan to release another Rambo game, this time based on the third movie starring Sylvester Stallone. The game will not be a commando-like arcade romp like the previous release, instead it will feature arcade adventure sections, such as infiltrating Russian prison camps. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. From this month on I'll be listing the top 5 games each month, rather than trying to put in the best selling titles. So at number 5 we have Outrun from US Gold. At number 4 we have Commando from Elite. At number 3 we have Exelon from Houston Consultants. At number 2 we have Renegade from Imagine. And at number 1 we have Match Day 2 from Ocean Software. And that was the news and top selling games from May 1988. Joust was released into the arcades by Williams Electronics in 1982, and the brief given to the programming team was to avoid space games. The team went away and came back with a knight flying on an ostrich who has to defend evil knights riding buzzards. What the hell were they on? The gameplay is tricky at first, as you have to get used to the inertia and the flapping controls that move your ostrich. To kill an opponent you have to collide with them, being slightly above them at the same time. This produces an egg which falls to the ground, and also has to be destroyed. Once all the knights have gone, the next level begins. A great game that requires accurate controls, so how would the Spectrum conversions compare? First up we have Beaky and the Egg Snatchers from Fantasy Software, released in 1984. Although the initial levels look familiar, the gameplay here is slightly different to the arcade. There is no flapping control, or indeed any riders. You do, however, get a laser. At least that's what I think it is. The idea is to protect the eggs, and to do this you fly around shooting the egg snatchers. There is little inertia here, and when your bird is on a platform you can't just walk off the edge. You have to press the up key first. This often proves the difference between saving or losing an egg. The graphics are a bit bland, but there is some nice animation when the bird lands and skids along, like the arcade. Sound is limited to a few short effects, and gameplay, although frantic at times, is just different enough to make this game average for this comparison. Next we have Crazy Cars from JB Software, released in 1985. 
This game takes away the flying ostrich and replaces it with a flying car. However, the game is very polished with some nice incidental tunes, speech and good sound effects. The graphics are small, but fit well within the screen size, and movement is very smooth, as you would expect from an arcade game. Control is tricky and takes a while to get used to. Many times you die in the first few seconds of a level, and if you're not careful, you can get the infinite death loop and lose all of your lives. The level changes, like the arcade as you progress, with the floor being removed on level 3, making things even more difficult. Colliding with the enemy cars leaves their helmets on the bottom level, and you have to collect these. Once they're all collected, that completes the level. A great version, if a little difficult, but worth it once you master the controls. Next we have Joust, from Softech, released in 1983. This game was later renamed Ostrom, probably due to copyright issues. However, the game still begins with the phrase, prepare to joust. This game was written by Andrew Glaister, who also wrote Orbiter for Silversoft. But remember that name, we'll come across it again later. Here we have the familiar layout, but the floor is removed right from the very first level, making it difficult from the start. The graphics are smooth, but do flicker badly. The game's start sequence is nice, mimicking the arcade with your ostrich rising from the ground. When you collide with the knights, they don't drop eggs, so to complete the level you just have to kill all of them. Overall an average version, with some features missing and very quiet gameplay. Next we have Lancelords, released by Rabbit Software in 1983. Although if you break into the loader, you'll see that the save routine calls it Joust. On to the game then, and here we get quite large, smooth graphics. But the game plays at a much slower pace than the arcade version, and in fact previous versions we've seen. That said, it makes the game much more playable and you can get a good long session out of this without too much frustration. When you collide with the knights, they drop eggs, and these have to be jumped on to be destroyed. You can't just bump into them though, like the arcade, you actually have to fly above them and drop down. This can be a bit annoying, as the eggs will hatch if not taken out quickly. Sound is used well, with some good effects, and I think this is one of Rabbit's better games. There are a few issues like collision with the eggs, and sometimes eggs can bounce off screen, meaning you can't destroy them, and there's also a strong rebound when you hit something, which can often see you flying backwards out of control. The scenery does change each level though, giving you more challenges as you progress, and overall this is a good version of the game. Next we have Warlords, released by Century Software in 1985. And this is another game written by Andrew Glaister. This game was released a few years later though, so we would hope for some improvements. The ostrich looks really good, very much like the arcade, but things drift away from this point. The knights are replaced by odd shaped sprites. The gameplay is much the same, roughly, however when you collide with an object they don't drop anything, they just disappear. This game is tough, and even after playing all these games with inertia, I found it tricky to actually hit anything, as you can probably see. Sound is used well, with an effect used for flapping, appearing and colliding. But sadly, with the gameplay changes and difficulty, this is not a game I enjoyed at all. 
And finally, we have Winged Warlords, released by CDS in 1983. Again, we get the familiar layout, but when you start the game, it plays really fast, making it very difficult. I will admit my first few games were terrible, and I never actually hit anything. I eventually got used to the controls and speed, but even then, this game is very fast. The graphics are small, but move smoothly enough, and control is easier than the others in that you don't have to keep stabbing the flap key, just holding it down will send you skywards. Sound is used really well with some nice effects, and when you hit one of the knights they fall off their horse, well I think they're horses, and sink to the bottom waiting for you to kill them. There does not appear to be levels in this game, just a continuation of knights appearing constantly. This is a fast and frantic game, easily matching the arcade for speed, and is probably the closest. However, without changing levels and vanishing floors and lava and eggs, there are many things missing. Well, that's the end of this shootout. Not many clones to choose from here, and a mixed bag, as you would expect. Choosing a winner, even with so few contenders, was difficult. I have to base my choice on completeness and how many features of the arcade were implemented, because this is where many games fell short. So, the winner, in my opinion, is Lancer Lords from Rabbit Software. It may be a bit controversial, but it has all the elements of the arcade, and the slower gameplay makes it much more fun than the others. A close second was Crazy Cars, only missing out because of the changing graphics. Otherwise, this is a great game. This is GB Air Rally, released by Activision in 1988. Apparently, I'm a lunatic who wants to fly the GB, at least according to the manual. The GB Air Rally is a flying event held, in this case, in Ohio, and sees pilots from around the world competing in various tests of skill. The game has eight levels, with four courses in each, the last one being a special event, such as low-level flying or balloon popping. After the intro screen and somewhat terrible music, the game begins, and we're thrown straight into the first race. Here you have to fly a set course, and avoid the other planes, and get round as fast as possible. Hitting the planes will slow you down, and if you hit them too much, something nasty will happen. The controls are simple enough, left, right, up and down. The throttle is automatic, so once you press it to take off, you leave it well alone. The plane even lands itself at the end, so this is not exactly a simulation. Once in the air, your plane, looking rather nice, flies over a scrolling landscape, made up of stripes. The usual way the spectrum represents 3D movement. The speed and altitude dials just seem to flip about wildly and give no aid to navigation, so I just ignored them. There are signs and posts on the ground showing you which way to fly, but I found it much easier just to follow the others and gradually overtake them. As you approach the other planes, you have to be very careful not to hit them, as I've mentioned before. The engine noise is a bit weak, and the only other sound is when you hit something, so you'll be playing the game just listening to this most of the time. If you reach the end of the course, the colour scheme changes and you set off again. If you get to the fourth course, the special event for the first level is balloon popping.
Here you fly low and pop the balloons, obviously, but there are still other planes to avoid. And also what look like telegraph poles. These are quite tricky to miss, as they're at the same level as the balloons, and usually appear in the line of flight, giving you little time to move out of the way. And this is where I had my first crash. Tumbling out of the plane, spinning through the air, and landing in a pigsty. Nice. The gameplay is very repetitive, and once you play through a few levels, there's very little to bring you back. The graphics are nice enough, but the sound really gets on your nerves after a while. It would have been far better to offer improvements for 1 to 8k owners. But they didn't, so you're stuck with this. This is Death Star Interceptor, released by System 3 Software in 1985. No doubt you will guess what type of game this is by the title, and I remember buying this as a kid in the hope of recreating the Star Wars game I saw in the arcades. The first thing that amazed me was the speech. Wow, a spectrum talking. The first section is very tricky. You have to guide your ship into the thing, whatever it is. The manual says it's a stargate, and you have to hit this dead center. Once you do that, it's into the familiar space scene, shooting incoming TIE fighters. These zoom in and swirl about nicely, with some impressive 3D graphics. They shoot back, and this is a fairly hard part of the game. The Death Star slowly approaches as you fight your way towards it. Sound is used really well, with the scream of TIE fighters as they approach, and the explosions when you hit them. The only thing missing is a firing sound, which is a bit of a letdown really. Once past this, it's on to the one that everybody waits for, the trench sequence. Here we get the nice effect of a moving trench, with laser turrets to avoid and other objects on the ground and flying towards you. With the laser turrets you can either fly around them, or you can shoot them. As you get further in, ground-based tanks appear, as well as other TIE fighters. And even though you have five shields, as shown bottom right, it's very difficult to get this far. Well, it was for me anyway. Watching the RZX playback, things get really tricky as you close in on the exhaust port. Shooting this, and your ship flies away before... A difficult game then but one to keep trying, as you certainly want to get to the end part yourself, but it won't be easy. Terrapins is a new game by Alan Turvey, and is a version of the old arcade game Turtles. The game is excellently presented with some great music and graphics, and the gameplay is enjoyable and typical of the arcade games from the early 80s. Baby Terrapins have been kidnapped and taken to a high-rise building, and you control Mama Terrapin in a bid to rescue them. They have been hidden in various crates around the level, and you have to check each one. If you find one of your babies, they climb onto your back and then you have to take them to the home icon to drop them off safely. There are nasties in the form of different coloured bugs that are intent on stopping you, 
At first these are slow, dumb yellow bugs, but as time goes on and the levels increase, they mutate into faster and more intelligent nasties. Mama does have bug bombs though, and these can be collected from time to time. Dropping one of these in front of a bug will stop it for a while, allowing Mama to escape. Not all crates have babies in them though, so you have to be careful. Some have other bugs. The graphics are great, well drawn, well animated, and there's a nice tune that changes for different levels. Gameplay, as I've said before, is typical of the early 80s arcade games and has been implemented well here. This is a great game and definitely worth checking out. It can also be purchased from Chronosoft on real tape, so for the collectors out there, if you want the real thing, go and grab it now. This is Egghead Goes to Town, the new game from Jonathan Coldwell. Anyone familiar with the Egghead series will immediately feel at home here. Masses of screens to navigate, masses of objects to collect, and plenty of platforming action. The graphics, as usual with Jonathan's games, are well drawn, well animated, and move really smoothly. Control is great too, as you would expect, so any issues with you dying is just down to you really. Some of the jumps are really testing too, and these have to be judged just right, otherwise it's time for an omelette. There are ladders that take you to other screens, but be careful, some of these can cause quick deaths if you're not prepared to jump straight away. A bit unfair maybe, but hey, it keeps you on your toes. The screen designs vary, with references to real places, like the Baron of Beef pub, which is a nice touch, and of course each screen is full of things to avoid. If you drop too far, it's fatal, which sticks to the standard platform format, but can prove very tricky to judge the height when you're dropping down from one platform to another after completing a level, and it can be a bit frustrating after completing a screen just to have eggheads splattered all over the place. The sound consists of nice little tunes as you walk about and enter each new room, and for collecting new things, but there's nothing for walking or jumping. For platform fans then, this is a mammoth game that will keep you occupied for a long time. It's executed really well, and it's certainly recommended. This is Pinball Wizard by Sagittarian Software, released in 1983. Yes, a pinball game in 16K, and another game I bought back in the day. Because of the screen ratio, the table presented has two sets of flippers, which does help with the overall gameplay. The screen layout looks very colourful, and the usual features of old pinball tables are present, like bumpers, traps, lights, and bonuses. To launch the ball you hold down the key until the plunger is at the position you want, and the ball is sent into play. The ball physics are not 100% accurate, as you would expect from a Spectrum, let alone a 16K Spectrum, but they're not bad. And the only time you see problems really is with flipper detection. Sometimes the ball is nowhere near it, but it still reacts. This is not a major flaw at all though, and the game plays really well. There are plenty of challenges, plenty of areas to try and get the ball into for higher scores, and plenty of action. Sound is used well, with a variety of effects for different things, and I really enjoyed playing this again. It brought back happy memories, and I think this is the very first electronic pinball game I played. 
a good game then, and definitely worth playing. Magazines. Are you sure? Well, I just started recording, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Right. No, magazines. There were some great magazines. I I was Crash. I had Crash from the one with the Indiana Jones cover, which I think was issue six. Yeah, it's one of the early ones. That wasn't yeah. it. Wasn't that the one that concentrated on 3D? It, they were talking about 3D yeah. in it because it was uh, they had layers, did the different layers of scenery. Yeah, they did, and they had that massive article on 3D. I think it was called 3D or not 3D. I I've I started with Crash from the very first edition. I I've still got my original issue one Crash magazine uh, and I uh, very recently I put it in a polythene envelope just to protect it because I'm always in and out of my magazine boxes to yeah. do various things and, and you know get reviews and things but uh, I've still got my original Crash issue one which I'm very proud of. Yeah. I I've, I've got a big box of them but they're all kind of doggy and the covers have come off and there's, yeah. there's yeah. Um I've seen your is your issue one mint. Could you sell it for whatever ridiculous price that it would go for on eBay? It's it's fairly mint, yeah. Um, I, I haven't sort of looked at it in in that respect. I haven't looked for the condition. I was just going to read things, but from from memory, I'll have to get it out and have a look. But from memory, it's pretty good, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because that one's that one's pretty soft. That wasn't in color either, was it? It was like um, the non-glossy pages in black and white. Yes, I think the only glossy glossy page was the front. Mm. And of course, it had another absolutely brilliant cover by, well, the first brilliant cover by uh, Ollie Frey, didn't it? Uh, Ollie Frey, it did. Right, just just hang on, because I'm going to go get it. Okay. <laughs> this would be very crap on audio, but hang on a second. I know where exactly where it is. It won't take long. Right, I'm back. I ha- I've got it, and it is mint. Yes, it is. It's very good. It's very good quality. Flog it, Paul. <laughs> we were wrong. It's not all black and white. There are a lot of colour things in it. There's a... Um, a colour glossy review of 3D Death Chase in it. For me, Crash was the the, the best of all the magazines. I, I, I mean, the, my favourite collection of well, not my favourite, my favourite group of magazines. The first had to be Popular Computing Weekly, mm. which I got every week. The newsagent held it for me every week, and I had a complete collection from probably eighty two to about eighty seven, due to circumstances beyond my control. Um, several house moves, and I lost over half of my collection. But Popular Computing Weekly was was my sort of, it was my everybody else at work bought the Sun or the Daily Star, and I bought Popular Computing <laughs> Weekly. <laughs> I think I know which I'd say was the um, more trustworthy news source. Yeah. The other the other magazine I got, uh, which I got regularly, was ZX Computing. I didn't get that. I can't remember having any copies of it at all. It was uh, in its early days. It was brilliant. It was really good. They covered a lot of technical things. They did reviews of, of hardware and all different styles of games. Mm. I really enjoyed that one. They all got bad, didn't they? They were all great. I used to. I used. I always. I got Crash. Um, it wasn't a subscription. My news agent. It was a kind of subscription through the news agent. Um, and then I used to occasionally buy if I saw a good article or something that caught my interest. Sinclair user or your your Sinclair. But I always prefer Crash. Sinclair user was a bit thick and kind of stodgy, and your Sinclair. Well, actually, that I never liked the reviews in your your Sinclair. They were always a bit thin on the ground, I think. And of course, Crash had the best covers. Oh, obviously, yes. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> by a million miles. <laughs> Going back to the three D issue, by the way, that three D article. Yeah. Night Law wasn't released then, so it's a bit weird. You've got a three D article for the Spectrum that has hasn't got Night Law in it. It hasn't got the only 3D isometric game is Ant Attack, oh, right. um, and then there's like 3D Monster Maze and other things where there's a bit of shading and Android 2, I think, is in, but it didn't even get as far as things like TLL, I don't think. Um, okay. So, so it's it's quite weird going back and reading it now, thinking, well, hold on, what about and you think, well, no, because this came out before Night Law. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or was written before Night Law. But did did you have any really? Odd magazines that you that you sort of only saw once and bought very few of, maybe one or two. I don't think so. I can't remember getting any. I used to get CMVG, actually. Every now and then I would get CMVG as yeah. well, if it had something Spectrum related. In. It was always interesting looking at the other games and things like that and wondering if the Commodore 64 really was any better or not. Um, yeah. 
The the one magazine that I got sort of now and again would be Micro Adventurer. All right, okay. Which was sort of very limited to adventure players. Yeah. Um, I've still got about three or four copies of that. Um, but that was sort of, if, if I saw it, I'd sort of mm, maybe buy it, maybe not, depending. Whereas if I saw ZX Computing, uh, I'd always buy that if I, if, if I saw it. Yeah. Is there anything you didn't like about magazines? Was there anything going on your nerves or anything? When it, when they started to turn to teenage magazines, when they started to become irrelevant, they had stupid pictures of people and they had um, fake letters and they mm. had uh, just sections that didn't really interest me at all. Yeah. Uh, it all started to go downhill rapidly and then and then it just sort of petered out. I think I think it was a mixture of I was getting older. Yeah. And other things in my life were, were were changing, like like women and houses and work and things. Um, I think I said in my in episode forty, the games playing public were getting older, but the yeah. magazines were catering to a younger audience, which, yeah. which didn't fit with how things were working. Yeah, and I think it's interesting. I remember the the crash user surveys. The the year on year, they would ask people how old they were, and the the age got younger and younger. And because when they went to cover ticks, they went rubbish as well. I mean, you you went from something with a a ton of editorial, really th- really good things like the three D or not three D article in Crash, to a few reviews and he's a cover tip um, with some old games on it. That that was magazines. Great at <laughs> first, got rubbish when they start putting cover tips on them. <laughs> yeah, and, and gradually gradually reduced to pamphlets. Yeah. Were you disappointed by the volume of sound that came from your spectrum? Those zaps and swishes just not cutting it? Well, there were several options available to you. Many of us linked up the ear socket from the spectrum to the mic socket of our tape players, and by pressing certain buttons, you could get sound out of the speaker although you did have to keep the tape running. Another option was an internal modification, or better still, by an external amplifier. There were several on the market, and this one, the ZX Box from Interservice Electronics, was such an item. Costing just 9 95 meant it was within range of many users too. Before I could review this unit though, I had to fix it. When I bought it, it was listed as broken, with a rattling sound coming from inside, and I guess this was the speaker that was loose, so I took a chance. When I got it and opened it up, sure enough the speaker was loose and both wires had snapped. I removed the old wires and put in two new ones, soldered them to the speaker, remounted the speaker to the circuit board, and a few screws later it was back in the housing and ready to use. The box itself measures 110mm by 60mm by 30mm high. It has two ports on one side, one for the power and one for the audio in. On one side there's a large volume wheel. It has two leads coming out, one is the power pass-through, and I have no idea what this one is. To connect it up, you unplug the power from the spectrum, plug it into the ZX box, you plug the pass-through power lead from the ZX box into the spectrum. You then plug a mono audio cable into the ear socket of the Spectrum and connect that to the output of the ZX box. Because the holes for the speaker are in the bottom of the unit, it's best to try and stand the unit up to get a clearer sound. And when it's all set up, you can turn it on and hear what it sounds like. This is how the Spectrum sounded without the ZX box connected. And plugging it in reveals the difference. Not bad really considering the volume is only about 50% and it's certainly loud enough. Music and sound effects are much louder and clearer through this unit and I was pleased the only thing wrong with it was the speaker. In our modern world you can connect the spectrum to the audio in of your television now but back in the day this was probably the best and easiest way to get better sound. This is a nice unit that delivers decent quality, at least from the Spectrum, and I'm sure anyone who would have bought one would have been very pleased with it.